Hi, it's Elizabeth Willits here from Investing in Women, and I am delighted because this week we have a very, very special Facebook and LinkedIn Live for International Women's Day, and I'm going to be talking with comedian, performer, women's rights, promote, rights promoter, and feminist Tova Lee. She is a huge, huge legend on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, and we're going to be talking all about her background how she's made um, career pivots, been really brave in her career and her life, and also a little bit about International Women's Day as well and her hopes for the future. So welcome, Tova. Thank you so much for joining us today. If people are logging on, if you can let us know if you can hear us all okay, give us a like or an emoji, that would be fabulous. If you have any questions for Tova, please pop them in the comments. But I'm so, so excited to have you here, Tova. Thank you so much for joining us today for International Women's Day. I know it was yesterday, but we're celebrating it all week. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh. Um, I've got loads of questions for you. So, yeah, if people don't know Toba, I got introduced to you actually through Mother Pocket. That's, she shared one of your videos last year in lockdown. Um, and Toba, she shares really funny videos that often make you think as well. And you also share some, some more thoughtful videos interspersed with that. So if you don't follow Tova, I'll put all her um, social media handles um, afterwards so you can follow her. But it's so good to have you here. So first question, <laughs> did you dream of being a performer when you were a child? I know you grew up in Israel. Is it something that you wanted to do? Or what sort of child were you, quite an extrovert? Did I dream of being what? A performer? A performer. A performer. Um, yeah, I probably did dream about it, but I but I but I didn't think it would ever happen. <laughs> Were you in school plays and not really. No, I, I wasn't that kid. I did ballet and I did a lot of like shows, uh, you know, ballet shows and stuff like that. But um I used to I used to perform in our living room and at home, but I wasn't in the drama association I wasn't that kid at all I think in my for my family the arts weren't really something we the, you know my family really kind of encouraged us to pursue mm -hmm. so for me I sort of knew from the age of I don't know eight probably I was going to go and do law school and I was going to yeah. become a lawyer and you know go into maybe business and that was kind of like really my direction from a very early age but I think I always had a passion for the arts and I was, I've always been a writer. I used to write stories and, you know, that type of thing. So I think it was always there. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So was I, law something you wanted to do or was it sort of family pressure or expectation? Or? I mean, I don't think it was pressure, but you know, when someone, if you tell someone something for long enough, they end up believing it. And then maybe they even think that it was their dream for themselves. I think yeah, that yeah. that happens a lot. So I think that I that's when I when I reached the point where it was time for me to pick a what I was going to do in, in university, I wanted to go and do law. But I don't think I even realized that there were alternatives. It just yeah, 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 it was something that you sort of thought it yeah. so long. You thought it was what you wanted. Yeah. yeah. And... Um. So it it was kind of like the obvious thing. It was the obvious choice. Yeah. yeah. And it was only at the age of thirty. Oh. that I did that first pivot, the really big one, uh, and sort of left the law uh, yeah, yeah. and decided to take a chance and like see, you know, actually, can I become an actress at the age of 30? Mm -hmm. And that's and that's when I came to England because I knew that I didn't want to go back and do three years and do a BA. You know, I was 30. I, I had I had I had practiced law for a few years and I just felt like I'm going to go and do a master's and then see if I can get, you know, go to castings and see what happens. Um, and Israel didn't have a course, a one year course for acting. It just didn't exist. It doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, so I came to London. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, what I mean, brave thing, yeah. you know, obviously it's, it's worked out for you, but it must have taken a lot of courage to have that um, faith in yourself that. That was the right decision it could work out for you you'd probably you know, you know no one knew at that point that that was the right decision but how did you find that inner courage yeah i mean i think it was a combination of uh, several things like maybe courage was one of them but also at the same time i was going through a divorce so i had just split up with my first husband and 
uh, for me, it felt more like a fresh start. It was actually an opportunity to get away and yeah. to have clean, like a clean slate and a, a fresh start. You know, we had been together for nearly 10 years and, you know, all our friends were the same friends, all the places yeah. we went together, all of that. There was a lot of baggage and history. And I just felt like actually going for a year because that's that was my plan to go for a year. <laughs> and, and you're going to go back to Israel. Yeah, go back. Yeah. <laughs> I officially left with one suitcase like that was it you know and came here um so you know and it was hard I talk about it a lot uh in my first book uh F to 40 I talk a lot about the you know how difficult it was to make that move and transition even though I really needed that change because I think a lot of a lot of the time we know we need a change, but making that leap is really difficult. And you know, there's that saying, uh, whenever a door closes, a window opens, or maybe it's the other way around. I'm not sure. Yeah, I but know. I think uh, the, 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 strong, the hardest thing to do is to take that jump when you can't see the window yet. And mm -hmm. I think that was like the, that was where I was at. I sort of didn't know. And I thought I'm just going to go because, but I was feeling so bad. So it was like, I can't, feel worse than what I'm already feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The only way is up. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I, so you I did your master's, and then what prompted you then to stay? So the cliche is that I met uh, Mike, uh, so it was a lot <laughs> maybe stay. <laughs> oh, no. Do you know what? That is, that is, that's a nice reason to stay, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and I actually met Mike at the end of that first year. So I was getting to the point where I was about to finish my degree, and then really reassess and decide what I was going to do. And even though I, I I had had a nice year in London, I don't feel like I was settled after that one year. I had friends from drama school, but a lot of them were younger than me. I felt like I still hadn't found my place. Yeah. So there would have been a really good chance of me going back to Israel, I think, after that year. And then I met Mike and 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 the rest was history. And then I thought, OK, I'll stay a bit longer. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, and then you, do you know? In a way, do you think it helped you making that decision to try something new? Thinking initially, you were only going to do it for a year and then go yes. back. Yes, I think it's a get. It's a great strategy. I feel like anything that is reversible, a is just generally speaking less intimidating. So knowing that I could go back and that you know maybe I lost a year out of my career, I can get back into it. It's like the end of the world. It wasn't like I was giving up something, can never go back to it. Uh, but I think yes, telling yourself, it's isn't it a bit like when you break up with someone and you go, let's just take a break, but yeah, really yeah. want to break up. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. that. <laughs> Man, your bro, like that. Rachel, we were on a break. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. It definitely does help, I think. <laughs> so you obviously <laughs> finished drama school and then you started auditioning and, and going for roles. How did you find that? Because, you know, I did performing arts at college and I, I didn't take it further because I knew I was going to struggle with that rejection. So it's, yeah. it's about finding yeah. that resilience, isn't it? And that, that tenacity yeah. to keep going. So, yeah, how did you sort of steel yourself for that to deal with potentially rejection and... I mean, I think it's not for everyone, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm being really honest. I think that the rejection is very harsh and it can really uh, be deflating and degrading and demoralizing and depressing and all the Ds, basically. Yeah. Uh, very much so. Um, having said that, I think that the fact that I was over 30 helped. So I don't know how I would handle that type of rejection in my early 20s. Had I started earlier, I think I would yeah. have found that much harder. I think at 30, you have a better idea of who you are and what you're made of to be able to rise above it. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt when people say no. The other thing that helped me personally was I was very impatient in a sense that I couldn't really sit around and just wait for people to write roles for me. So I started writing roles for myself. And then I started producing my own little short things and, and, and films and whatnot. So as doing that, I got to sit on the other side of the casting table and actually cast people to be in my productions quite early on in my career. So what it, it gave me a real insight as to as to why people say no. And I realized that 
honestly, 98% of the reasons why you don't get a role as an actor, and I, I, by the way, I say this to myself now, even as a content creator, has nothing to do with you. It's just because you were wrong for the part, you were too tall or too short, or they pictured someone slightly different from you, your accent, like, it has nothing to do with your talent, with your abilities, with you as a person. It's just something about it just doesn't fit exactly in the, in the biggest, in the bigger picture. So after that, rejection became much easier because I didn't take it so personally anymore. Yeah. Brilliant. So you were producing your own short videos. Were you putting them on Facebook at this point? Or no, you... no, I wasn't on social media at that point at all. <laughs> did, did they even have Facebook? By that? I'm so old. You look brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. But no, it was, I was doing like the proper, you know, the, the, the like festival scene. So I got into the world of filmmaking, like indie filmmaking and, um, sort of found directors and people in that world and and yeah and just you know we just put things out into the world i don't know they were on vimeo and like uh, different uh, streaming platforms that are filmmakers yeah um, and i even uh, wrote and produced and i think i co-directed like a pilot you know so like I got to taste the world of filmmaking on a very small scale, but quite a bit before I went into content creating. And the reason I'm saying all of this is because, uh, you know, at the time it, it could have felt like a real waste of time because nothing amounted of it. Like it didn't, I didn't become a filmmaker, but I actually years later realized that I learned so much in that period of time. So when it came to the point where I was starting to make um, content, it was literally started from writing. I had a blog, but then very quickly I saw people online making videos and I thought, oh, well, I know how to do videos because I know how to direct and I know how to act yeah. and I know how to edit because I've, I've done it. Just I did different things, but I know how to do it. Uh, why don't I just try and do that? And that's how everything happened. And so oh without knowing, I was collecting like a, a tools into like my toolbox and that's what I, I say to people like that, you know, I, I just personally think that any life experience that you have, anything you learn, any skill, I don't know, these things don't go to waste, you know, somehow they, it all kind of makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. And you look back and you think, yeah, that's why I'm where I am today. All yeah. these steps that I took yeah. previously <laughs> have amounted to me, to me now. So what prompts, you saw people doing it online and you thought, I think I can have a go with that. And so was that, you started your blog in, on Facebook in 2015. Was that that point? You thought, I'm going to have a go, you know? Yeah, the blog was before the videos and it was more out of, honestly, sheer desperation. It had nothing to do with wanting to be creative. It was more about just wanting to get my truth out there because I was, you know, I was uh, a, a young mom. I mean, I, you know, not really young. I was never really a young mom. I had my first at 35 and the twins at 37. But my point is I, motherhood was still new to me and I was really struggling. And I, I, I honestly was not like a, um, I was not, you know, like uh, there are women who motherhood really comes naturally to them and blah, blah, blah. like I wasn't that person at all. So I uh, and I felt really alone because no one else seemed to be like that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I just wrote about that, like just wrote about actually this is how I feel. And, you know, does this make me an awful person? But this is how I feel, you know, and this and this and that. And actually then, you know thousands of women around the world were a bit like, oh God, this is exactly how I feel like. Thank yeah. God someone said it because I thought it was just me. And that's kind of how the blog came about. Yeah. Um, and then the, the videos came after because what I realized was that people were, I was writing very serious, although there was a bit of uh, funny in there, but it was more like from the heart and sort of like, you know, a bit more serious. But then I saw people doing videos and using comedy and humor to get their messages across. And I thought that's so interesting because actually when you do find the humor in things and never in the moment, by the way, because in the moment I want to kill everybody. Much later, much later, I can look back and find the comedy. Then actually, if I can tell the same story from those eyes, then it, 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 it does help. It does help because then other people might be able to help to, to laugh about it and just feel less, you know, drowning by it all. Um, yeah. Your so 
So that's how I started doing my funny videos and my funny rant videos. And, you know, but it's honestly, it's such a mix smash. Like there's so many, you know, there's the serious videos, the feminine videos, the parenting stuff, the, the musical videos, honestly, because deep down inside my, one of my biggest dreams was to become a singer, but that's never going to happen. So <laughs> I think that's the beauty of you in your account, because it's not, it's not one dimensional. And but that's women aren't one dimensional. We're not just moms. We're not just white. We're not just. There's all these different parts of who we are and different things we want to express. I mean, I was going to ask you: Were your early videos funny before pre Facebook when you first finished university and you were editing and producing those shorts? Were they funny? So I did a few uh, short films, and one of them I thought was quite funny. It was a dark comedy called uh, Christmas uh, Xmas Eve. And it was like uh, four stories of different people and how their stories entwine in each other. And it was like a dark comedy. I thought it was very funny. <laughs> um, but not everything was funny. Um, not everything was funny. But I, I've always loved playing in 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 comedy. You know, um, it's I think it's a uh, people think it's easier, but actually I find it's harder. Yeah. Uh, I think it's harder. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, especially maybe when you're having to be intentional about it. It's kind of, well, I'm not, you know, if you make a joke off the cuff, it's maybe a bit It's easier. also so know. subjective. Like some people, there's so many different types of humor, you know? Yeah. You, it's hard to to get it right, I think, with comedy, you know? Um, well, Abigail said, she's the mother of twins too. She loves your videos. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, comments so I'm sorry I'm being rude but I can't see comments oh, that's all right people are just saying they can hear us they're enjoying this conversation so how do you find the inspiration for your videos so life yeah <laughs> most of my videos are about I guess day-to-day -day stuff that most people go through I mean you know maybe the video you were referring to earlier was about lockdown was it was the lockdown i remember it was you with an ironing board <laughs> can you remember you probably remember but maybe you filmed a lot you took your ironing board out and you were looking pretending to look at a neighbor i think oh that was a TikTok trend yeah no but i did like a whole uh i did a few uh lockdown videos where anyway those were like yeah so i guess just go just day-to-day -day things things that that you go through and then you realize oh wow everybody goes through that so that's the topic that's worth kind of maybe making a video about and then in recent years I mean a lot of my videos were about parenting at the beginning and then they evolved into other things because you know without jinxing it my kids are in the sweet spot at the moment they're not so annoying right now <laughs> <laughs> well, how old are they <laughs> so they my eldest is 10 so yeah. not quite a teenager or pre like she's not there yet. And my youngest, my twins are eight. So yeah. it's a really nice age. And I think I have probably another year, two years before it kind of erupts again. And they're teenagers and it's awful. Uh, so at the moment, I don't have a lot to say when it comes to that aspect of my life. But, you know, I feel like uh, women's issues, women's rights always been kind of at the heart of everything that I do. So I talk more about that now. And of course, women just in general being over 40 uh you know perimenopause sexuality all those things you know there's like it's never ending so it really is i draw it from life from from yeah. my life yeah and there'll be some people that are watching this the i know i've seen you share before where you've shared a, a really brave video i remember you sharing one last year about sarah everard and it was it was so touching the truth is that it, honestly you know what you were saying really resonated with me and I'm sure if people dig it out it would you know it would really make them think but you must share these videos knowing that you potentially might receive a lot of hate potentially yeah. from men and get those comments in your inbox or whatever and there'll be other people that are watching this that also can receive unwanted comments in their yeah. inboxes so how do you deal with those do you deal do you just block them ignore them respond with humor it really depends, uh, you know, like I can't put all of them in one um, in one bag and 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 say that they're all exactly the same because they're not. It depends. You know, it depends uh, what what the what the context is, like who it was and what they said and what was it about? I mean, as a general rule, I try not to really care so much what strangers think about me um, mm -hmm. and less so if it's a man telling me something that like 
you know, about being a woman. Like I'm not interested. It's just that really has very, very little impact on me. Um, but you know, it can be draining, like to say that it's not, it's, it, it, do you know what, at the end of the day, it depends on your, your state of mind. There are periods where honestly it goes above my head and I don't really care. And there are times that I guess I'm going through something and then it has a bigger impact. It's again, like I said, with the acting and casting, it's not for everyone. So again, this, it's not for everyone. And, and there are ways to protect yourself. Like if you are a social media influencer or creator or whatever and you do get a lot of, there are ways to protect yourself you know you can turn off your comments you can block people you can even ask an admin or someone to go through them for you and have a buffer person i know a yeah. lot of people who do that and it's very smart you need to be you need to protect your own mental health and you know whatever i i i've learned how to skim through comments and just not see the bad ones and also when i get bad ones they're a bit like this isn't about us having a conversation now and you disagreeing with me and let's have an actual chat. You're just trying to be spiteful or to hurt yeah. others. I block, 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 not an issue. No worries. No problem. Like I'm not interested. Yeah. yeah. I'm not interested in it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I remember you wrote, writing a post about being asked to work for free to gain experience. And I think they, I wrote a similar post last month um, about being asked to work for free for myself and got quite a lot of response. So I wonder how you feel. Or about, what type yeah, of the other people are, you know, people are getting, a lot of women are being asked to work for free, particularly people that are freelancers, set up their own businesses. So what message would you have for them about basically knowing your worth and... Oh God, don't even get me started. Cause this topic, I can actually like go off on one and never stop speaking. Cause I, it drives me crazy, drives me crazy. I don't know one single man in the world that would ever work for free. Like, I just don't understand it. And I actually, you know, I, I don't, I don't have like uh, I don't know this for a fact. Okay. Cause it's not like I went and interviewed uh, other, uh, you know, influencers or content creator, male influencer or content creators, but I, I just, I, I, I somehow have this feeling that they they don't they're not asked to work for free for a dress or a lipstick. Like I I, I find it so um it, it really does make me angry. It's one of the things that make me really, really angry. Um, so yeah, I'm like, no, I can't pay my bills with a dress, can't pay my bills with a lipstick. You know, your shoes are very lovely, but I can't pay my bills with that um and also and also you know i've worked i've worked really hard to get where i am i have a, a, a you know a range of skills that you know actually are worth a lot of money so you know you want to work with me great here are my rates and yeah. that, you know and that is all um, I do, however, do a lot of things for free, obviously with charities, of course, that mm -hmm. I support and I work with, and I'm so happy to do. And there was a time where I was really kind of, oh, I'm going to help all these small businesses and all that. But if I'm being really honest, I can't really do that either because I'm a small business <laughs> as well. <Yeah. laughs> it's just me and, and Alex, you know, like, um, and even if I am not a small business in other people's eyes or compared to other people, you know, when I was a small business, I didn't ask people for things for free if I'm being really, really blunt and honest about it. And I and that might come across as awful. But you know what? That is actually the truth. You know, I no, no. So, you know, when we can support, we support. But uh, business is business and and friendships and supports is is that, uh, yeah. and, you know. And I think that, um, yeah, I try to tell my uh, like friends, especially from the world of creation, because by the way, it's exactly the same in acting world. The amount of times I have heard, me and fellow actors have heard the words, oh, you should do it for exposure. Yeah. It's just, it's, oh, it's crazy. So you walk on set and everybody from the DOP, right? to the sound guy or girl, to the catering company that they got, the location. Everybody is getting paid except the actor yeah. or actress, might I say, because they're there for the exposure. What is that about? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a, probably a combination of women, but also uh, just the arts in general. People don't really appreciate it when it's um, 
uh, artistic jobs. So you were talking uh, freelancers, but you were talking about like d designers. Um, yeah. 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 Roles and when I've spoken about it in the past, actually, a lot of people who have completely different uh, jobs to me but are in the same kind of like creative world have said that they've had similar experiences. Like, people don't appreciate that the creative because they always feel, Well, you enjoy what you do, so you should just do it for free because your, <laughs> your payment is the joy that you take in your art. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, it's Claire said the only time like you that she works for free is with a select few charities. So I suppose yeah. it's knowing where your line is and yeah. and yeah. So yesterday was International Women's Day and the topic was break the bias. So I'd be interested to know, and I'm sure a lot of people would be, what biases would you like to see broken? I mean, okay. there's loads, obviously, but for me, it has to be, um, you know, one of the main things that I talk about, obviously, is sexism. And I think when it comes to stereotypes, gender stereotypes, uh, that for me is like a major passion. Um, and I'd love to see a world free of gender stereotypes and people just being allowed to just be themselves and people without all of that nonsense, you know. Of mm -hmm. girls like that and boys are like that and um i went to see uh one of my daughters had a school play actually the other day and they had done something for international women's day and it was about breaking the bias and they were talking about sexism and i was like i had tears in my eyes i thought god if we only if if all schools are doing this like i hope they are you know i don't know are they i don't know and if they if, if this is what we're teaching like our children then there's hope because i do believe that the way to break the bias is through education is such a key factor in it because you know at the top level you've got better laws are needed. You've got, let's get women into uh, roles, uh, you know, where they can actually be decision, they can make policies and they are the decision makers. Absolutely. But how do we get there? Like it has to filter from the bottom and actually it starts with the children. It starts with education. So whether it's education at home, what do you talk about your kids about? Talk to them about sexism. There is no age that's too early to talk that, to, to discuss that. Like honestly, as early as the age of five in a way that's appropriate for a five-year-old but that has to be like an ongoing conversation and not just with girls and this is a mistake that I think a lot of people make think this is conversations to just be to just have with girls but actually we should have them with boys um we should just have them with everyone um and yeah and I think that that you know that's you know that's my hope is that it will filter and our, the next generations will be smarter than us, you know? Yeah. So it's going to final question. I don't know if anyone's got any final question. I know that you've got to run off um, on the school run in a bit. So if anyone's got any final questions, people, you know, commenting, really enjoying the chat. You've seen people with freelance, um, freelancers and designers being asked to work for free. Someone said those who have degrees um, in the arts work really hard. Um yeah, final question for me. And if anyone's got any last questions, um, pop them in the comments. Do you have three daughters? They're eight and ten now. What hopes do you have for them in the future? Well, I, I mean, you know, again, just not to repeat myself, but that is my biggest hope. Like, first of all, it will be, I mean, you know, for all women and for all females and not just my daughters, but everywhere in the world, actually. You know, I, I'd love to live in a world where um, women and, and, and girls and females and, you know, could just be can feel safe, you know, and and I think gender violence um, is a major thing. You know, it'd be lovely to live in a world where women were, were not scared to walk down the street in the in the, in the dark, you know, that 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 would be even my in the light, to be honest, even in the light. So. <laughs> I <know>. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the other day I, walk, I went out for um, a, a sort of a walk, whatever, and it was just about getting dark. And I had done like this Instagram story and someone messaged and she was like, oh, God, I was like holding on to my chair because it was getting dark in the background. I was so worried for you. And I thought to myself, oh my God, that's so sad. But what's so sad is that it's I, I made a decision to go and run uh, not on my normal route, which is kind of like by a park, but I actually... Yeah around the main road which I don't like because I knew it would get dark by the time I came back 
oh, I just hope they don't have to think about those things ever, you know? Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we've had um, a question from Georgia. What's your top tip in remembering your worth as a woman, particularly when you're starting your career? Wow. What a great question. What a great question. I mean, for me, everything in the end of the day goes back to, um, to being yourself. I feel like if all fails, like if you're, when you're in the moments where you don't know, you don't know, it's just coming back to yourself. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, like the fake it till you make it. Do, do you yeah, know that? I've heard it, yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, for many years, I you that was my tool. <clears throat> so if I felt a uh, lack of confidence, if I, you know, needed to go into negotiation or do something and I wasn't really feeling it or I was like shaking inside, I would fake it, you know, fake it till you make it. And it works. It's a great tool. <clears throat> it works. But it works until it doesn't work, you know, because sometimes there'll be moments where you'll go, it's, do you get what I'm saying? Like there, yeah. sometimes it doesn't work. And the second thing is, it does really come with a massive price, you know, the faking it till you make it and the price being that you are giving up your authenticity, your authentic self. You're not, you're, you're, you know, and that you're paying a big price, a personal price, but also like, what are you showing other people around you, your children, maybe, I don't know. I have now found a better tool and my tool is to come back to your authentic self. And even if that authentic self means that you have to, you know, that you are feeling shaky and that you feel that shaky, I, I that's okay. Like, I think that's okay. Uh, I, I don't know if I've made any sense now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Made any sense. Um, and I don't know if I've answered uh, her question, um, but I just, yeah, I don't know. What was it? Uh, how do you feel your- How do you know your worth, remember your worth as one woman starting your career? It's hard, yeah. isn't it? I mean, yeah. Um, Angel has said, what go-to books do you recommend reading? Wow. Um, I've just finished reading Invisible Woman, which is, it's not a, it's not a fun book to read. <laughs> it's an interesting book. That really, book makes you think, really opens your eyes, actually, doesn't it? But it's also going to make you really, really angry, so... <laughs> <laughs> book and I think it's a really important book uh to read um I'm trying to think there was a really great book that really inspired me oh god what was it called now um wait um something like oh god is it running with wolves am I making this up now that Hang rings on. Bell. The, the title rings bell so wait, it's about like women's, uh, I'm sorry, I don't really read uh, um, n like novels. Okay, Women Who Run With The Wolves, that oh, one. No, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, really, really love that one. I read it a few years ago and that was a good one. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, well, thank you so, so much. I know you've got to rush off. <laughs> Of course, and of course, my book, my book. Oh, yeah, sorry, and your podcast. <laughs> really good book. <laughs> Remind everyone, what's your book called? I can't, can I say the, the name, the actual title? I don't know. Let's call it f at 40. Okay, f at 40. And your podcast, is it Till Death Do Us Pod? Yes, we're on a break at the moment. We haven't done it in a while, but it is. It's Till Death Do Us Pod. Indeed. Yeah, and you're on Facebook, totally, Instagram, totally. Um, Everywhere. And, and I'm not on TikTok, but are you, is it totally on TikTok? Is that yeah, over underscore Lee. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much. People have really enjoyed it. So they love how you address big issues with passion and humor. Um, someone said, keep it real and stay authentic to yourself. So thank you. And because I'm just writing a post about that as we speak, you know, about that. Oh, <laughs> so. Brilliant. Oh, I'm sure everyone will be looking out for that. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for all the videos, all the inspiration, really making us think. So thank you. Thank you for your time today. Day. thanks a lot thank you to everybody that's watched as well thank you bye